Abracadabra. Every vanishing act uses distraction to divert attention away from what's really happening, the magic trick. This is Holy Trinity Church, Stratford-upon-Avon, where Shakespeare's buried. Here's his grave, his monument, and this is the Holy of Holies altar stone, which mysteriously went missing around about the time of the Bard's death. Three tons of solid marble, nine foot long, three feet wide, two foot deep, just disappeared. It was found 273 years later, hidden just inches beneath the church. It's quite some vanishing act. But by the time it was found, no one made the connection between these two events. A couple of years ago, I performed excerpts from my Shakespeare musical, just inches from the grave, right here. During rehearsal, I erected a huge promotional banner, but its real purpose was to hide the altar from view. The church is heavily protected, of course. Alarms, 24-hour CCTV cameras, even a forensic system that sprays intruders with a chemical detectable for up to a year. Don't risk it. 100% <laughs> conviction rate. I wasn't doing a David Copperfield. When the performance was over, the altar stone was still there. No one had seen my team behind the banner. So what was going on? Why were we risking arrest and imprisonment? Christopher Nolan's magic movie, The Prestige, says people don't applaud when you make something disappear. You have to bring it back. Shakespeare pulled off the greatest vanishing act ever. He wrote nearly a million words but left not one play or poem, not a page, not a line, not a word in his own hand, just six barely legible signatures, all spelled differently. Handwriting experts can't even agree they were all written by the same person. The ultimate writer never wrote a letter to anyone. At the height of his fame, no one even reported seeing anyone who claimed to be the poet or the playwright, and when he died, not a single eulogy. No one noticed. The Stratford establishment sweeps all this aside and says it's quite normal for the time period, but it's not. 24 of his closest contemporaries all left plenty of evidence of their writing careers. Only Shakespeare's record is a complete blank. Naturally, this has caused many to doubt the official story. But as Sherlock Holmes says, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Well, a three-ton rock doesn't just get mislaid. Nor does every single trace of the most famous 25-year career. What remains, therefore, in both case cases is the disappearance was intentional. If we start from there and search logically, we're far more likely to find the truth. If it is the Stratford man, we should clear his name, yes, and if it's not, we should put the crown on the right head. When I started this journey a decade ago, that's all I wanted to do. I'm a classically trained musician, so for the first two years, I was writing it as a musical. But I soon found out many scholars suspect he left a code revealing where he hid the manuscripts, and I started to see it more as a Da Vinci Code type thriller. <laughs> Another two years, the book was finished, and at the end, I had my heroine announce she's cracked the code, revealing where Shakespeare hid everything and why. The only thing was I didn't have an actual code. I rationalized, well, if Dan Brown can do it, I'll just make one up. But my conscience kept nagging me. What if you get on Charlie Rose? You can't tell him you've never been to Stratford. You haven't seen his grave. Have you even tried to find a real code? <laughs> just. Wouldn't stop, I was shamed into booking a ticket. But that trip changed the entire purpose of everything I was writing and the next six years of my life. Has it ever happened to you, you meet all the right people at exactly the right time, every door swings wide open, <laughs> first day there. My goal was to get close up pictures of the whole grave area. It's impossible, it's closed off to the public. I've been inside the church 10 minutes, out of nowhere, a man introduces himself. Tall, suit and tie, polished shoes, steers me over to the vicar, snaps a picture of us. We get chatting, I tell him I'm researching a book. He 
He's the head verger, John Cheel, and for 18 years, he's been documenting every square inch of the church. He says he's got tens of thousands of photographs. Would I like to see some? <laughs> An hour later, I'm having tea at his home, looking through hard drives of world-class pictures, stunning quality. He says I can use any I want for my book. <laughs> Drives me back to the church and we bump into the woman who runs the fundraising committee. She hears my Manchester accent. She says, ooh, you sound just like Davy Jones. <laughs> She's a huge Monkees fan. I, I couldn't make this up if I tried. I was Davy Jones's musical director for years. I ghost wrote his autobiography. I created an award-winning graphics book, Mutant Monkeys. I give her and John signed copies, naturally, and now I'm in like Flynn. Second day, John's taking pictures of me at the gravestone now. I read on the plane that code breakers for decades have been searching the most visible public texts, like the gravestone and the monument and the sonnet's dedication. They put them into grids and the secret lies in knowing the exact grid length that makes the keys line up so that they point to letters in the same positions in the private texts, thus revealing hidden message. Now, apparently, they never include punctuation in their grids, but I must have skipped that chapter because I'm counting dots, commas, and I notice a tiny difference between the rubbing that they sell to tourists and the actual gravestone. There's an extra dot in the punctuation. Strange. Fourth day, now I'm reading about John Dee, greatest cryptographer of the Renaissance, locked away a secret text grid, actually numbered, telling us the exact grid length, 24. Total, 624 squares. So on a hunch, I add up all the characters in all three public texts, put them into the same 24 grid, including dots and punctuation, and it's one short. Then it hits me, that missing dot. Abracadabra. Imagine I was going to just make up a code out of thin air for my fictional story, and I end up being given the actual key to the whole mystery. And here it is, the double T. There are five sets of them, and they point to the same letter positions here in D's grid, revealing a message. But I noticed that the same key is in D's grid, five sets of double T's. And they point back to letters in the same position here, revealing a second message. Cipher text and plain text work both ways. Revolved in the entire history of cryptography, this is unheard of, except in Twelfth Night, Malvolio is trying to solve a code and he reads a clue that says, if this fall into thy hand, revolve. No one made the connection. But if you revolve these grid, the double T's now point to different letters here, revealing a third message, and these double T's give us a fourth. Now, just think of what this means. These grid was locked away in a secret location, not found until 63 years after his death. These messages all refer to an altar stone hidden underground, remember? Not found until 1889. Now, why would he do that? Unless this was never intended to be solved back then. It's a message to the future, to us. We've all heard of iambic pentameter, right? Five beats. To be or not to be, that is the question. But when he writes for magical beings, fairies, witches, he uses four beats. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Living page, yo stigmata, I have hewn desiderata. It's his magical calling card, a rhyming couplet. In modern language, it says there's a living page, a preserved record. Yo means look at, the stigmata, those are Christ's wounds. They're represented by crosses carved into a consecrated altar stone. I have hewn, cut into stone. 
desiderata is Latin for my desires, what I want you to know. He wants us to solve his magic trick. People don't applaud when you make something disappear. You have to bring it back. Why couldn't I just go to the church and tell them what they've got? Tourism? Stratford alone brings in over half a billion dollars a year. Academia, out of about 100,000 universities and colleges worldwide, you know how many give courses in Shakespeare authorship studies? Two. Nobody wants this boat rock. So I go to the church and ask nicely, what do you think they'll say? Thank you, Alan. <laughs> this is historic. Let's open it right now in public. Or are they going to take a look in private first? We all know the answer, and there are just three possible outcomes. One, there's nothing there. Alan's a raving lunatic. Two, there is something there, and it supports the official story. It'll be made public overnight. Alan's a hero. <laughs> three, what's in there debunks the official story. It'll remain private forever. Alan's Prius develops an electrical problem. I can't announce what I found without potentially destroying it. But I can't not announce it. It's the holy grail of literature. I've got to get slam dunk scientific proof first. Insurance against them changing anything behind the scenes. I spend the next four years, six trips to Stratford, cultivating the church. I design a calendar for their gift shop featuring John's photos. We plan a Davy Jones fundraising concert. They begin to trust me. I'm granted access to film wherever I want. Finally, I'm just inches from this priceless masterpiece that I know will rewrite history. It's still not close enough. I need to get in. What would you do? You'd offer to do an exclusive preview of your musical next to the grave. They can't spray their guest artists. You'd ask them to turn off all the lights so you could sing the last song by candlelight. It'd be so beautiful and so dark. <laughs> You'd have your radar technician slip behind the banner during dress rehearsal and put a protective layer down so as not to damage the holy relic. You'd have exactly three and a half minutes working in total darkness. You'd have a hidden camera person filming the entire thing in night vision. You'd need proof. Nobody would believe you. It's too bloody crazy. The lights would come up, the banner would come down, nobody would be any the wiser, and you wouldn't have taken anything except zeros and ones, and an hour later, a 400-year-old secret would be on the hard drives of two of the leading radar labs in America. <laughs> That's what you'd do. The rest is science. All consecrated altar stones have to have a saint's cavity hewn into them that holds relics of a saint. A little blue area is what you'd expect to see in the scan. The two labs worked independently of one another using separate protocols to assure accuracy, and they both came up with the same result. A cavity, six and a half foot long, Seven inches deep, 12 to 30 inches wide. It's 250 times the size it's supposed to be. <laughs> you don't cut a hole this big, <laughs> this big into solid marble unless you're going to put something this big into it. Different software programs revealed differing densities within the huge cavity indicating the possibility of many layers of contents. The missing manuscripts, new, undiscovered masterpieces, who knows? Who'd like to know? How often do you get a chance to rewrite history? I'm asking you to go to this website and vote yes. I want to know what Shakespeare left for us, or no, I'm not interested. Let's leave it another 400 years. Let's see, on the no side, you've got the monarchy. So let's assume there's a hundred of them, including all their duchesses and dukes. Mm, all the residents of Stratford, obviously, at 25,000. Academics who've built their reputations on the status quo. Uh, let's say 100,000 worldwide. Check. But now, imagine, this is the holy of holies. 
where the mystery of Mass is celebrated, the body of Christ. To a Catholic, if there's anything inside here, other than the relics of a saint, it is by definition desecrated and the church has a sacred obligation to remove the offending contents and reconsecrate the altar. Pope Francis has about six million Twitter followers. Do you know how many Catholics there are worldwide? Over 1.2 billion. Do you think that might affect the vote? This is, look, this is still less than Gangnam Style got in views. Add to this the uncountable millions who simply love Shakespeare. 40 shows us about human nature, about power gone mad and insane love. And what wouldn't we give to read one more line from his immortal pen? He pulled off the greatest vanishing act ever. And we still don't know why, but we do know where. People don't applaud when you make something disappear. <laughs> it's when you bring it back. They go wild. Abracadabra.